Oh, I am behind. I am behind, but I am here. Let's transition. Bam. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Brendan, and this is Accidental Origin, the weekly writing web show, uh, where we're continuing on our short story adventure. Uh, so yeah. Um, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Uh, how's the audio? Is the fan too loud? Because it is ridiculously warm in here. Um, so I would prefer to keep it on. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of loud. If, if it's too loud, I'll turn it off. Maybe. I'm testing out some different things. Because there's a lot, a lot of white noise. And I agree with you that I prefer that there would be some white noise, but I can't really, like, I keep trying to find a balance and it doesn't work. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I know. That's what I have said to. I don't know. See, like, now it's... Yeah, well, I mean, that's for film, right? Like, that's not exactly, it's not exactly the same thing. No, there's no issue. I said it to do that on purpose. <laughs> not an issue. Because I just, every time I try, it just gets ridiculous. Whatever. Oh, fine, I'll leave it open. Or did it, oh, no, never mind, one sec. Those levels, though, they are bad. I don't know. I don't know if there's much I can do about it at this point, but it's probably too late.
Yeah, well, you want to punch me usually anyway, Rob. Wow. Is that better? <laughs> it seems better. Am I too quiet now, though? Ugh. I hate audio. It's so hard. Why is it so hard? question that's a good question I do not know the answer either but fair enough okay so we're gonna try it like that see if that helps let me know if I'm too quiet so I've turned it down a lot so Maybe that'll be better? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see, this is my problem. How about now? Is that better? Better or worse? Yeah, it's better? Okay. Yeah, my computer is very loud at the moment. Probably actually adjust that a little bit. actually get this show on the road um so it's extremely hot today i apologize i'm gonna be mad sweaty um the humidity is is in the ridiculous at the moment um It is 31 degrees Celsius right now, which explains a lot. Explains a lot. So yeah, I'm gonna be really hot. <laughs> um, last night I tried out VR for the first time. It was super legit. Um, the amount of cool storytelling things that I want to experiment with is enormous. Um, yeah, totally worth it. <laughs> oh my god. Um, so yeah, uh, that was awesome. Uh, and just other random news about me, uh, on Monday, so tomorrow, I'm starting the, uh, edits for Game Chef, 
So uh, it's the like selection round where we all give each other feedback and and select a, a the community votes for for who goes through into the finals. Uh, so that that starts tomorrow. So that's another cool thing that I'm going to be doing. Because um, I don't have enough work to do, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no. All the work, all the time. Um, so there's certainly that. Um, what else? Oh, I think that's it. I think that's it. Uh, I'm still... Uh, wow. Focus. Focus, Bureau. Focus. Okay. Uh, so I did do, uh, I did do another weekday stream, uh, on Thursday this time. Uh, and I did a bunch of web updates. So I worked on the website and made some cool changes and stuff. Uh, for those who have never been there, it's right here, right there. On the screen, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's been updated on there. Uh, I'm gonna keep making updates to that this week. Uh, there's a few things I'm planning on putting up there, including uh, some reviews of the books for the book club, uh, maybe some reviews in general. I'm still playing around with that. Uh, but I had considered doing, uh, like whenever I finish watching a movie or media or something or stuff that's modern or relevant, then I can review those as well. Still playing around with that stuff. So let me know if uh, you have a preference or if you have suggestions or comments or whatever. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, you can do so on the website or also on Twitter at free cloud mishaps. Um, or so just send me a message on Twitch, though that's less likely to get to me, but you never know. So yeah. Uh, so I did that. Uh, we're going to continue now. Well, since, since the the main part of the competition, Game Chef competition is over. Uh, I'm going to be continuing on the short story today. So we're gonna keep working towards, uh, keep talking about to like writing topics uh, this week. So there's that. Um, anything else I wanted to touch on? No, weekly art. Yeah. Nope, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell. On my little note list here. Uh, just gotta add one thing. Cool. So there's that. Uh, I did get some of the show notes for episodes five and six done, but I still have to finish those, and I will. I promise. It's one of those things where I just need to sit down and do it. Uh, so yeah, I, I will I will get that done this week. <laughs> it's really hot, okay? It's really hot. Not to mention I have lights on, and no fans because fans are loud. My computer fan by itself is loud enough. So, there's that, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what are we doing this week? I feel super rambly. Ram, no. I feel super rambly right now. Okay. Main 
Assassin's Creed. Oops. So, what are we going to talk about this week? This week, we're going to talk about structure and outlines. Uh, and I'm going to try and do my best and not just talk theory at people, at you guys, and uh, apply what I'm talking about to the short story we're working on. Um, for those who are new, I'm not sure if there are any new people here, but if there are people watching the VODs or whatever, uh, for those who are new, uh, the story we're working on is a classical fantasy story. So based, based more on the fantasy tropes of mythology than the fantasy tropes of uh, high fantasy, uh, like Lord of the Rings style. Um, I have done a brief synopsis, a log line, and uh, some, some brainstorming with uh, the various characters and settings and stuff uh, that were randomly generated uh, from a drawing prompt website because, yeah, why not? It's good to mix, mix your mediums and, and try new things. So yeah. Oh yeah, and I totally missed. So this week, uh, I have done a partial outline, not a full outline like I had done in the past, uh, because I felt like I was missing. <laughs> I thought that I was missing um, a lot of my thought process, like during the game design episodes. Like I, I, I didn't feel like I was directing my energy properly. So this time I tried to just do uh, headings. So nothing nothing too much, but just headings. So hopefully, um, hopefully that'll keep me on track. So yeah, <laughs> we'll see. I'm not doing so great so far, so yeah. <laughs> but you know, learning process, right? learning process. We're all here to learn. I'm here to learn. I'm still pretty new at this. This will be the eighth week that I've streamed. Um, yeah, the eight, the eighth, it's the seventh episode, but I, I, uh, I took a week off cause I was at a convention. So this is week number eight for me. Uh, I've been doing, including the test streams. That means I've been going for about three months at least one stream a week. The last two weeks I've done two streams a week. So there's that. Um, yeah. It's a process. It's a learning process. I am feeling more comfortable in general, more comfortable talking to the camera, talking to you guys. Um, but it is it is something that I'm working on. Um, and don't be afraid to, to give me feedback. Um, I'm, I'm totally open to that. So yeah, don't hesitate. Yeah, yeah. Love feedback, feedback's good stuff. So, outlines, structure. The shark in the background is actually uh, one of two diagrams I kind of just doodled on the wall there. I'm not gonna be referring to them super hard, so you're not gonna need a uh, close-up view or anything, but they are the basic, the basic idea of a three-act structure and a five-act structure, which are the two main types of storytelling. Uh, going back all the way to um, Aristotle's Poetics, um, yeah, Aristotle's Poetics, which was written in the classical era the heyday of Greek culture. Um, and uh, for those of you from the uh, 
North American world. Um, so, not not you, Johnny. Ha. Um, you'll know things like five acts. Well, five acts tend to be used in things like Shakespeare. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna have I'll have zoomed in one like blown up ones when I get into more detail. I just wanted to draw them on the wall to have something on the wall, you know. Um, so yeah. We got stuff. So what do all stories have? Um, that's kind of where we want to begin, right? We want to, we don't want to have the, um, we want to have the basics, you know, what, what, what elements are Or what elements make up a story? So, four, three weeks ago, three weeks ago, we'll talk about these a little bit more. Ooh, that one's that one's nice. So this is basic. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh, three weeks ago. I talked a little bit about the five main things that, that make up story. So they were character, plot, setting, theme, and conflict. And today, uh, because of what we're talking about, we're going to talk about conflict and we're going to talk about uh, plot. Because those are the two most important things to how your story is constructed uh, in terms of moving it forward. Uh, character plays a big part of this as well, but we're not going to talk a ton about character today. Um, just some generalizations more than anything else. So there's that. Um, yeah. Uh, but the reason character is important is because characters and their wants and needs, not just your main character, but all the characters drive the plot forward, drive the action forward. So you need characters with believable wants and needs in order to have a good conflict that will drive your plot. Okay, we're on the same page. Well, yeah, we're, we're all on the same tab. It's right here. <laughs> but yeah, so to facilitate this discussion, we're gonna break it down real simple. Beginnings, middles, and ends. If you've ever taken a literature class, high school, elementary school, beginnings, middles, and ends. Those are the three parts of a plot, beginning, middle, end. So yeah, we'll start with that. If you, if you don't know what your character wants or needs, then you need to go back and start from their backstory again and build up uh, a psychology for them so that you can uh, derive a want and need because of that. Keeping in mind, that in most cases, wants and needs are different. 
and are almost in opposition to each other. They don't have to be, but in a lot of cases they are. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, there's what's called a status quo. And the status quo is basically how everyone fits into the universe. Like, I'm a streamer and a writer. So my status quo is that I'm going to stream and write. Like, that's, that's where I fit into this story universe of the fictional me. And say something happened that caused me not to be able to write or uh, not to be able to stream or, or something that would change that, that's changing the status quo. And what that does is, is, in most cases, the want of the character is to return to the status quo. Because that's, that's what we liked. That's what we had. Um, like, that, the, that's, that's what I want to be. I want to be a streamer and a writer. So if, if something happened that I couldn't do that, I, I try and re restore the status quo. I try and get back to that. Figure out how I, can, how I can start writing again or start streaming again. So the way that this works is then, but what, what do I need as a character? Do I need to be a writer again? Or maybe I need something completely different but I don't know that I need it. And in searching for what I want and getting what I want, because ideally that, that's how, well, not ideally, but in a lot of cases that's how the character realizes what they want isn't actually what they need, is by getting what they want and realizing that it's, it's, it, it didn't fulfill them in the way that they thought it would, right? So, yeah, like in, in a lot of cases, the want and the need of the character are different uh, and, and oppose each other. They don't have to. Um, there's plenty of good examples where, um, where they're, they're not necessarily all that different. Uh, sometimes what you want is exactly what you need. The resolution of that story won't necessarily be as satisfying um, and in fact, in my opinion, probably wouldn't be, but it also depends on the realizations of the character and how they approach those problems. Um, so yeah. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, in the example I just stated, uh, the character of me wants to return to the status quo. There also is a type of story, which tends to be more of a coming of age style story. Uh, that the character is part of the status quo and wants to change the status quo. They want to become something different. Right? And that's why I say a coming of age style story where they're stuck in a rut and they, they want to escape that rut. So they, they, make, they make changes. And through, those, the, the, through their want line of wanting to make a change, they discover what they actually need, whether or not that's to return to the way the status quo was because they were true, they were actually happy and didn't, and, and didn't realize it, or that there's something even more drastic that needs to happen in order to, for them to, to figure out what they want. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the way that I approach it. And the, the, uh, I mean, I was reading Sid Field, right? And in, in screenplay, Sid Field talks about uh, a character exercise that he did with some of his classes where he started from a name. He's like, class, give me a name. And then he asked for an occupation. And he got an occupation. And he said, well, you know, why why did they choose this occupation? Well, that's what they studied in school. Why did they study it in school? Because there was something that happened with their parents when they were young that, that changed their mindset so they would study that. I mean, it, you, you go down the rabbit hole at that point. But starting from, from those kind of basic building blocks of saying, hey, he was born at this time, contextually in the setting, what happened during that time that could influence them? What major events on the world? I mean, 
me, uh, I'm almost 25. Uh, I grew up, you know, I remember September 11 as a kid. Uh, I remember um, a lot of the war in Iraq. I had uh, some of my friends' dads and stuff served overseas. Dads and older brothers served overseas. Um, I remember the Irish voting law where, you know, gay marriage was finally accepted in Europe, in, in parts of Europe. Um, there's, there's lots of the things that have influenced me as a person. Just like there's lots of things that have influenced you as a person. Uh, politics. I know it's not necessarily someone who follows politics, but people who, who, people in power who make decisions influence things. And that has a trickle down effect. Maybe I'm not into politics, but someone I, uh, someone I admired really was. And so changes in politics affect someone I admire. So that changed how I interacted with certain things. It's a, it's, it's in a lot of ways, I approach things like that in the same way that we talk about chaos theory, you know, a, a butterfly's, a butterfly's wing beats in Japan causes a tsunami halfway around the world. <laughs> and if you if you kind of sit and 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 study yourself, like really sit down and say, you know, what memories stick out? And there's reasons they stick out. Um what um like what memories stick out why did they stick out um how have those affected me good and bad um how did um how did where i live change my perspective on things you know there's a difference living in suburbia compared to the inner city if you moved around a lot if you have lived in the same house since you were a kid. Those are, those affect your, that, those affect you and therefore those also affect characters. And how, how characters approach those things influences plot, influences conflict. And so therefore matter to, to what we're talking about right now, but just to, to story as a whole, right? So yeah, um, and, and I'm going to spend probably like the next episode, I'm going to do really heavy on character, um, I think, that's the plan, uh, so hopefully that will be a thing, but yeah, like I'm going to dive heavily, like deep into character and what make characters tick, so look forward to that. And it, that moment, that moment where you realize you're like 35 minutes in, 40 minutes in almost, and, and you really have only spent five minutes talking about your topic. <laughs> yeah. We know, we know we're doing well when. So. Focus, Brendan. Focus. Focused. Now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ronnie. I tried to break it down a little bit less terms and a little bit more concrete examples. I realized um, that I don't use examples enough. Um, it, it's an effective tool uh, that I really don't use enough and I should use more. So. That's kind of the approach that I wanted to take with this episode today, where instead of just being like, oh, hey, so here are the parts of a story. Here's the parts of structure and just and just visualize that. I'm I really want to sit down with my with my word processor open and just be like that, like I'm going to I'm going to take my synopsis and detail this out for you. 
So yeah. Um, and and I'm glad that that people are learning things. I'm glad. And I did see you there, Sparky. So thank thanks for coming. Keep lurking. I'm all good with that, as long as you're learning something. So yeah. This. It's in that direction. This is the common five act structure. So like I said in the beginning of the episode, there are two main types of structure, of, of plot structure, for storytelling in, in, in classical thought. There's the three act and the five act. Five act tends to only be used for drama nowadays, and even then, not as nearly as much as it used to. Uh, it it's heyday, other than maybe in dramatics, like because uh, Greek theater used a lot of five act sort of style plays. Uh, but it, it it kind of peaked at around uh, Shakespeare. So you don't tend to see it a ton anymore. Especially because a lot of drama has actually changed to two-act plays or one-act plays uh, for time and, and uh, casting reasons. That being said, um, every act will have a beginning, middle, and end. And every scene in an act will have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, so it doesn't really matter how many acts you choose to do. As long as they're consistent with what they're trying to do and they have a beginning, middle, and end. Right? Um, so yeah. And I'll talk a little bit about more about these, uh, these terms. Uh, but we're going to jump to the three-act structure. Because the three-act structure is the most common way... Um, let's blow this up a little bit. Why don't we? Boom. Hopefully that's not too blurry. Uh, the three-act structure is the most common story structure uh, used today. It's what they use in movies, uh, it's what they use in novels, it's what they use in um, short stories, though that gets a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, this, this is the most common style. Inherently, the two cover basically the same things but they cover them in a slightly different um, style. Uh, especially the amount of time spent on certain elements differs between the two. And uh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny says to me, apparently writing is all about psychology. And yes, writing is, in, is inherently about psychology. Um, because like any real like any real uh, sort of art form, uh, there's a huge amount of emotional content. And I don't mean necessarily from the writer's side. Um, how the viewer, uh, and I'll use viewer as a general term, I mean the viewer could be a reader, it could be um, uh, someone sitting in a movie theater, it could be you sitting on your couch at home watching TV. But how the viewer identifies with the characters, how the, uh, how the viewer can suspend their disbelief in order to, um, in order to, uh, to get into the story, uh, especially that one that has um, elements that are made up or imaginative or, or not of this world, you know, science fiction, speculative fiction, horror, that kind of thing. Um, that how we approach writing and, and how we tell stories is as much about the, the author's emotional, uh, emotional impact as it is about the viewer's emotional impact. How they're, how they're feeling when they read something. And, and every reader is going to have an inherent bias towards certain things. Um, as, as a writer, we talk a lot about character names. Um, that character names, what we name characters, uh, or 
how we understand characters' names, like just by give, being given a name, gets inherently biased by other people we've met with that name. Or other stylistic choices similar to that name. Uh, so, for example, um, if I named a character Rebecca, you'd be reminded, uh, say, say there was a really horrible, annoying person named Rebecca in your life, and I hope there's no one named Rebecca in the chat, because I'm not talking about you, but you would be inherently, you would inherently, like, you would feel a little bit of anger or hate or annoyance every time you saw that name because if you'd be subconsciously thinking about that person. Or maybe it's your best friend's name and you inherently like that person even though they're a villain because of the name. And there are things like that. How the, how the, the author approaches that is we tend to base character names on the exact same thing. Like, if I think of, uh, if there's an annoying character I want to write, I'm going to write him, I'm going to write her as Rebecca, right? Like, we're, we're subconsciously biased towards that. So, in saying that, the whole idea is that Psychology plays a huge role in both us as the writer and as the reader. Uh, symbols, um, and I mean, it's it's kind of funny that you talk about psychology in that way. Uh, everyone knows Sigmund Freud, or most people know Sigmund Freud. Most people know him as a quack nowadays, but to be fair, contextually, uh, he was ahead of his time. Fair enough. There's a lot of weirdness there, I get it. But his student, Carl Jung, studied dream theory and symbols uh, with respect to psychology. And th Carl Jung, his theories are actually more applied by English students than psychology students. Because all those thoughts that... that we, he studied about um, social interactions and, and social theories of symbols are super applicable to, to writing and are used by authors for years and years and years. Um, I mean, I'm a big advocate of reading the Bible at least once. Not because I'm particularly religious or anything, but because there are so many uh, stories in, in, in the Bible that have influenced... Uh, at least the English canon for hundred like thousands of years, right? Like there's years and years and years. Uh, Dante Alighieri, I'm a big fan of Dante's Inferno. Um, heavily influenced by by Christianity, but also heavily influenced by Greek and Roman culture. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff and symbols and, and things in that. Um, so yeah, like knowing symbols and, and knowing how people react to symbols and, uh, and how society approaches things is, is important um, to, how, to how we write a story. Um, so yeah. Cool. So, I hope that illuminated something. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, three X character. This guy right here. Um, there's a few really important elements. This one has a lot, and I really like this, but uh, you don't need every single one of these. 
um, necessarily. Uh, or at least to start, anyway. But, uh, yeah. So, the th there's, for me, there's three, um, there's two important elements, and then there's four sections. So the first, uh, I guess we'll start from the beginning. It's easier to start from the beginning. So act one, act one is the setup, the introduction. You introduce the reader to the setting, the characters, their wants, not necessarily their needs, but what they want in general and the main conflict. And there is some sort of element one, inciting incident. Something happens that causes the character to have to take some sort of action in order to pursue their want slash need. Uh, then you have the rising action, which is this giant section here. In pursuit of their want slash need, the character is confronted by obstacles, which create conflict and drama and make the story interesting. At the end of act two, you reach the climax element two. The climax is the point of highest dramatic tension in the story. It's where the emotions are highest. It's very, um, the final confrontation is near and the character makes a decision and or realizes something about themselves in that, in that situation, which then leads to the act three, uh, the falling action, uh, the events leading towards the resolution of the story. Um, and then you have the denouement or the wrap up ending resolution in which you tie all of the story threads together. Your characters experience something, he's learned something about himself. Um, stuff like that, right? So, what does that mean? <laughs> Why does this stuff matter? Um, structure is one of the really hard things about writing, and Johnny's complaining that writing seems more complicated than drawing because it's a lot more work. And the answer is kind of, but not really. It's just that the work is different. <laughs> and yeah, uh, whether what type of act structure you use uh, is entirely up to the author and depends on the story. Um, which is actually the next item on my list where I was going to talk a little bit about idea line. And I talked about this uh, in episode two, I think, uh, where certain ideas are better, su su are better suited to certain mediums and certain uh, lengths of story. Um, so because of that, how you interact with the three act structure differs based on the type of story you're telling. For example, the, cor the current personal short story I'm writing, uh, outside of the one that I'm working on for this, is a short story. Well, I said that, it's a short story. I am starting the story right here. 
the scene right before the climax. Because in a short story, you don't really have time in order to do all this stuff. You don't have the time, you don't have the space. It's not interesting to your character. You need to, it's not interesting to your audience. You need your audience to get into it as soon as possible. So the closer you start to the end of the story, the better it is going to be. With short stories. Um, that's not necessarily true of novels or longer forms, but it is true of shorter forms, for sure. You want to start as close to the end as possible. Because, at least I've found, uh, and I've talked to a few other writers in the last couple weeks about certain similar things, but I've found that we have a tendency to hide all the cool stuff until later. You know, you're not going to see the cool mech until Act 2, right? But people reading your story really just want to see the cool mech. And the sooner you give that to them, the more the the more the more they're going to be in, be interested in the story, and the more they're going to be invested in the story. And that's probably a exa bad example because not everyone's into mechs. Uh, mechs being giant robots, but the idea being that <sighs> trying like keeping everything hidden and secretive and elusive is not that interesting. It's not as interesting as you think it is. Everyone goes for that twist reveal, right? And they're hard. They're hard because they have to be set up in the right ways. They have to be set up in ways that are interesting to the reader without giving anything away, but at the same time have to seem like they're not holding anything back. Because at least the way that I approach movies or films or, or, or books that do things like that is I get frustrated. I get frustrated when you, when they hide things because I know that they're hiding something and having too many questions can really put a reader off. Um, it's one of the main reasons why the X-Files kind of bombed when it did. Um, and, and, and other things. Yeah, twist reveals are super hard. Um, they're one of the hardest things to do, in my opinion. Not because coming up with something twisty is it is hard in and of itself, but because everything leading up to the twist has to make the twist worthwhile. And in most cases, at least the stuff I've worked on that have twist reveals. Um, they're less interesting because of the twist reveal. Because all of the interesting stuff happens with the twist and not before. So there's no reason for the reader to even get into it, like to, to sit down and read far enough to get to the twist. Yeah, they're, they're really difficult. Um, I cut mine, basically. I started the scene before the, the climax where there's still kind of a twist reveal, but all most of the cards are on the table. There's not, there's not elusive stuff. It's not me being clever. Look at me, I'm, I'm clever. I have all these things planned that you're gonna see eventually. So yeah, difficult. Yeah, uh, and Inkart's an interesting example. Was that not the one they did the movie of? Did they do a movie of Inkart? Or am I thinking of something else? Oh, I'm thinking of Aragon. That's not Inkart. But yeah. Um, put your interesting stuff at the beginning. Put your interesting stuff at the beginning. Get people into it. Show them the world. You don't have to give everything away. But if you give them breadcrumbs, they're going to follow. It's the way it is. 
and it's one of those things where structure is kind of both the thing that allows us to be most creative, but also the thing that allows that that holds us back the most. Because structure is what makes movies predictable. But at the same time, if you don't have good structure, if you don't have good structure, your story is not going to be interesting. So you kind of have to tread this balance of being boring or predictable or both. And that sucks. Uh, But at the same time, I mean... Storytelling has been around since, I mean, oral storytelling specifically has been around for, I think, is it 8,000 years? Um, and, and to be honest, in my opinion, and I'm not a history expert by any means, but from the things that I've read about storytelling that, well, I mean, think about it this way. I mean, I talked today about Aristotle's poetics, which was written in somewhere around 600 BC. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> Man, I do bad with dates. You're real bad with dates and geography. I'm bad at geography, real bad at geography. Um, this is what the internet's for. Um, yeah, here we go. Nice. Poetic. Oh, it's actually earlier than I thought. It's 330, 335 BC. So techniques from almost two, almost 2,000 years ago are still relevant today. Storytelling is a long going tradition. Um, And that's not to say it hasn't changed at all. There are always new things happening. Um, For example, VR. Film. Film is um, the second, maybe third. Second or third youngest of the main mediums right now, artistic mediums right now. Uh, The only ones that are potentially younger are comics and video games. And if you think about it, excuse me, if you think about it, film is, is about 120 years old, give or take. Writing is, if we, if we go back as far as poetics, is almost 2,000 years old. Art goes back even further. So you start to see that in terms of how we talk and and discoveries that we make and and the way that we do things, especially in these technological mediums, is is a new thing. We are learning As, as, as a culture, as a global culture, we are learning how to tell stories in these mediums. How to do things. What's the best way to do things? When TV first came around, or even film to a certain extent, but it was more apparent in TV, but all the people who started in film and television when they first started up were theater people. Actors, Play directors, producers, 
They were theater people. And so, what did they do? The first thing they did was they started doing plays in front of a camera. Because that's what they knew. And then a few bright people came along and said, well, what else can we do that? Georges Méli, for one, theater musician. He started experimenting with cuts, with moving things around, with playing what the camera can and can't do. Things that you can't do in a theater setting. And then someone else said, well, what if we started started taking different reels and splicing them together? What if we start jumping between cameras, have multi-camera setups? What if we move the camera as we did it? This is how we've developed a visual language of filmmaking. It's a process. We're learning as a culture. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm sweating to death. I need to fill up my water bottle. I'm gonna take a five minute break. And then when we come back, uh, when we come back, I'm gonna open up my word processor and I'm gonna start banging out some of the concepts that I've talked about in terms of our short story. And one of the first things that we're gonna do is we're gonna give a working title to the story. Because I'm tired of calling it the first short story or the accidental origin short story. It needs something that we can call it. So, on my break, think of things. Classical fantasy, sirens, fawns, demons, go. All right? Taking a break. I'll see you in five. Uh, where's my mouse? There's my mouse. Cool, we're good.
And I'm back. All right. Oops, might blow that. Okay. Yeah, just consulting my notes here. Got it. So what we're gonna do? Open that, and we're gonna do a new document. Title it outline. Nice. So, I'm gonna show you my process or the, the way I've chosen to do it for this specific uh, story. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. There's just ways. And um, in terms of stories, uh, there are, there are kind of two main camps of outlining. There's the group that outlines everything first and then starts writing, and there are people that write and outline and outline later. Those are the two main camps. And I tend to be the former but I don't go at it as hardcore as everyone does. Uh, mostly because I find, at least personally, that if I don't have a plan in place, then I run into problems very easily and my focus gets divided and I stop writing. I run into writer's block, which is just poor planning <laughs> and lack of discipline. But yeah, um, so I'm of the first camp. Though what I tend to do is I tend to do a basic outline and then I'll write some things and then I'll revisit the outline and make more detail. And then I'll write some more things, detail, more things, detail. Um, I find it helps me better in that sense. The other school is the writing then outlining camp. It's the camp that my friend Sam does, where he'll write a bunch of scenes and then he'll piece together a story from those scenes. So he'll take the things that he's written and he'll say, well, this is an intro or this is a, a climax or this is a, an obstacle and he'll lay them into the story and do it like that. And then he'll write an outline from those, those little bits. I don't do it that way. I don't like doing it that way. Uh, it's I don't work productively that way, which I think is the most important way to look at it. Um, it's not very conducive to, to how I think and how I write. But if you want to do it that way, that's certainly okay. So yeah, it's up to you. But I'm going to show you my process, or at least the process I've chosen, because it tends to be a little bit, at least for me, it tends to be very story specific. I'll do it one way on one story and a slightly different way in another story. And I think a lot of authors will like that. Um, but yeah. So hot, oh my God. Okay, so we have our logline, we have our synopsis from these details and, and the things that we've talked about in terms of you know a three act structure, what do we have for this story? I'm gonna do something fancy, I'm gonna do it like this.
Yeah, you want to start up an accidental origin, it's hot drinking game? I'm cool with that. Oh, actually, is this a picture? This is a picture. I'm gonna do some fancy Scrivener things. Check this out. Research. Three act structure. Um, and I want to, oh, what do you do? Oh, no, that, that failed. <laughs> Let's try that again. Three act structure. Do, 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 do. Come on, you can get there. Them loading screens. Them loading screens. Ah. Come on. <laughs> really? Really? Sometimes. Probably is. Probably is melting. There we go. I got it. Got it. Got there. No problem. Just gonna copy this so I have it. Put this back. Cool. Yeah, awesome. So the knob says. So, I'll read out the synopsis, mostly because I haven't done this in a few weeks, and uh, A, I want to be sure of the details, and I also want you all to, to know what's going on. So, after, the crossroads, after his crossroads deal falls through, a destroyed billionaire seeks, should be an S there, to regain his power by, man, my typing is bad, summoning the demon he made a deal with. In order to do that, he needs the blood of a fawn and the feather of a siren for the ritual under a winter waterfall during the rising moon. An ancient siren has to escape a killer for hire and goblin raiders looking for her feathers so that she can stop the ritual and prevent the demon from being summoned. So, who's our main character? And who's our perspective character? Because they don't have to be the same person. By the way. Uh, my favorite example is being Sherlock Holmes. If you've ever read a Sherlock Holmes story, Watson is the perspective character. Holmes is the main character. But yeah.
But I thought the billionaire was the villain. Is the billionaire not the villain? What sorcery is this? This is my clever expression, by the way. I mean, clever. You bring up a good point. Or, in canon, we have brought up a good point. How many characters? Like, who are our main characters? We have the billionaire. We have the demon. We have the siren. Killer for hire. The goblins. And even though he's not mentioned in here, we have the fawn. So, who's going to be our protagonist? Who's going to be an antagonist? The villain. The person who is anti antagonist. Hey Sam, glad you could make it. BRing, I hope it was fun. Um. So yeah, who's our protagonist? Who's our antagonist? Who are our supporting characters? Who are our minor characters? Because they're different. Um, what do you think, chat? What do you think? I know what I think. And I get final say, because this is my stream. <laughs> but, but, I'm always willing to be influenced if you have a good, a good thought. <laughs> I can believe it, man. I can believe it. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. So, I think. Oh, yeah, I should probably explain that a little bit more. So, uh, the protagonist is the main character, the hero of the story. Uh, the antagonist is the person who opposes them. It tends to be the villain of the story, though it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, other types of characters, uh, supporting characters, uh, characters who... Uh, a supporting character is a character who plays a large presence in the story, but it isn't necessarily uh, the main character, tends to be the romantic interest, though a lot of people just set the romantic interest as a separate uh, separate type uh, entirely. Um, other supporting characters, um, for example, uh, if we use Lord of the Rings, uh, the main character is Frodo, Supporting character, uh, the main antagonist is Sauron, and the supporting characters are the Fellowship. Uh, though, though, in the third movie, uh, a little bit more in some of the others, but in the third movie, Aragorn is also a protagonist, and you can have more than one, um, just like you would have more than one antagonist. There's no real set limit, though having more than probably five seems dumb to me. <laughs> or really difficult to pull off well. I could, I, I have seen arguments 
about Lord of the Rings where people have argued that Sam is the main character. And I can see the logic behind that. But the only problem is, is that his dramatic want slash need is to create a giant garden that spans the entirety of Middle Earth. And it's super dumb. And they spend five or ten pages on it. On, on that specific dream. And it's it's awful to read. <laughs> it's so awful. <sighs> but yeah. Also. Uh, part of that is. Uh, one of the other reasons why I don't necessarily buy into Sam being the main character. Is because. Uh, if he was given the ring, he would immediately use it, use his power, and he, for me, he doesn't have the right type of strength and willpower to fight for something bigger than himself, bigger than just his wants. So yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so let's 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 do some of this outline <laughs> that I've been staring at. So, in my opinion, the siren is the protagonist. Uh, let's do this a little bit nicer, so it's easier to read. I am aware that he cares for Frodo for like li like literally carries him for most of it. I'm just saying that there's an argument there for sure, but I don't buy it. Siren is the protagonist. I think the perspective character that we should tell this story from is the killer for hire. And I'll explain that a little bit after I finish getting these out. I think the antagonist is the demon. I think the supporting characters are the billionaire and the fawn. Because I don't see the billionaire as an actual antagonist. I just see him as uh, a supporting character. And I think the goblins are minor characters. They're in there, but they're minor. So. That's hard to read. Let's go back to this view. That's better. Oh, this is super low as well. There we go. Now you can read it. So, the reason I chose the Killer for Hire as a perspective character and not the Siren is because I want the Killer for Hire to be an anti-hero. I want him to be uh, a bad person who does good things sometimes. And... I am super intrigued by the idea of, and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm immediately not following my own advice, but I'm intrigued by the idea of setting the story up as the killer for hire's goal of taking out the siren. 
misdirecting the reader from the overall goal of defeating the demon. But that's just the way that I'm thinking about it. Um, so yeah. Whew. It's so hot. So hot. All right. So, with that in mind, with that in mind, what elements of our synopsis are we going to plug into our structure in order to start building this story? So I'm going to write a couple of elements down and, and we can talk about them. Uh, we can talk about them as they apply to the story. Um, so uh, we're going to have our introduction. Let's do it like this. Yes. Our introduction, our inciting incident. Our rising action, our climax, falling action, and the denouement, resolution. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna get at least these elements tonight. Um, there's more parts of outlining uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more next week uh, with it, with in terms of the difference between scene outlines and structure outlines. This is a structure outline. We are creating the dramatic arc of our story. There's also what we call scene outlines which are the outlines, uh, like the, the breakdown of scenes, individual pieces that make up the story and how they fit in with the structure and also how they uh, pull the reader along with internal versus external scenes and different ways of, of approaching the story. Um, I usually work from scene outlines, to be honest. Uh, I like them a lot. I wanted to break this one down a little bit more before I got into scenes. Mostly because I don't have any, because it was randomly generated, I don't have any specific scenes in mind with the exception of one or two. Uh, and those one or two are probably going to be the sort of like climax, maybe inciting incident, maybe just another main obstacle sort of style ones. Um, but I'll go over those uh, as part of doing this exercise. Um, so yeah. So I'll pull up the synopsis here on the side. And fix that little corner there. So, the interesting thing, because I want to use a different perspective character from the protagonist, and I've stated that his goals are inherently different from the get-go, we're actually going to do this weird thing in my head, or at least the way I look at it in my head, where we're going to take two dramatic arcs, so basically two sets of structure, and we're going to join them in half. We're going to take the, the end half of the Siren one and the beginning half of the Killer for Hire one. We're going to create a new story. Well, not a new story, but we're going to create a new structure with both of those elements. And how they mesh together is, I think, what's going to make this story interesting. At least it is to me at the moment. So, yeah. So... It's hot. 
It's so hot. Sighting incident. The billionaire. Supporting character. Pays. The killer for hire. To. Get. Um. Oh, pays a kill for hire to get a vile, uh, a, uh, a, a skin, there we go, a wine skin of blood and a handful of feathers from the siren. The climax, um, and it's okay to jump around like this uh, when you're doing your own outlines. Fill in the stuff you know concretely, and then figure out what you need to do to get from those points uh, to get from one to the other. So I put an inciting incident there. I'm going to put the climax in. Then we're going to fill in, you know, what's the rising action going to look like? What's going to be the main obstacles and problems that happen in, in a very general detail we're not going to necessarily be like oh uh there are 10 things that need to happen here we're just going to give it an overall like you know what kind of thing are we going to see here so i think that the climax at least at the moment is going to be the ritual under the moonlight Okay, cool. So, what's gonna happen in a rising action? What do you think? How do we get from the killer for hire getting a contract to a confrontation and I'll write that down. At the ritual under the moonlight. How is the story gonna be resolved? Is it going to be a good ending? Are they gonna succeed? The siren and the killer for hire? Are they gonna fail? What if they fail, but the consequences aren't bad for them? Like, we haven't set what the consequences of this demon actually being summoned are. We assume they're bad because he's a demon, and we assume all demons are bad, just in general. I don't really think that all the time. I think they're more just selfish creatures. But, you know, I mean, that's a matter of perspective and a, and a matter of style. Like, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to approach? What, how are you interpreting that fantasy creature? Um, but yeah. What if the consequences for them failing are not nearly as bad as they thought? What if they get to the confrontation and the consequences are actually good. So they decide to fail anyway. I mean, I'm just, at, I, I'm just asking blind questions. I don't have a particular one that I think is, is better than the others, but there, there's, a lot of inter, there's a lot of open interpretation. There's a lot of Like, we're not going to have an answer to those questions necessarily right at this moment. Uh, I'm going to put something down that I think is going to be the way I'm going to I'm gonna shape the story towards. Um, 
but there's no right answer. And when we get more into character and defining who characters are and why they're doing what they're doing and what their needs and wants and all that are, we're going to, we're going to take another look at this and revise it and, and figure out, you know, what does the demon want? What's his purpose? Is he just causing mass carnage? Like, you know, they're, whatever he's doing. And figuring out how, what, what resolutions come from that. What character arcs come from that. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I said, you know, it, it, the writing process is really a process of laying something down and then coming back to it with more detail later. And, and exactly, Johnny, the demon could be totally harmless. Totally harmless. Um, that, that's, that's certainly something that can happen. Um, not necessarily. And in this case, I don't think so. But uh, I'm open to interpretation. So, if this were an epic, it would be a journey that would happen here. This was, uh, and I mean, as, because we've talked about it a few times, and I think it's one that people kind of know. Um, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is an epic. There is a long journey. Long, long journey. This is a short story and or novella. It's going to be five to 15,000 words. I can't write an epic. I don't, have, I don't have the space. I don't think this idea really fits an epic, at least the way that I'm approaching it. I don't think it needs to be an epic. I don't want it to be an epic. So it's not going to be a journey, or at least not an on-screen one uh, in that way. I think what we're going to see here is we're going to see several conflicts. We're going to see the killer for hire in conflict with the siren. He wants to kill her. Or at the very least, to get the materials he needs. Which, to do so, he probably has to kill her. Because she doesn't want to give him up. So, there's going to be that. There's also going to be elements of the killer for hire. In conflict with his contract. Right? We want, the siren is the main character. The siren is, has a dramatic need to stop the demon for whatever reason. The siren has to convince the killer for hire or stop the killer for hire from stopping her from doing that. And I've stated this several times over the course of this story, but the killer for hire to me is not an antagonist. He's not the bad guy. He's an anti-hero. So in order for him to be a true anti-hero, we need to, con the siren needs to convince him to join her side, to do the right thing in this specific instance. And that means that there's an internal conflict within the killer for hire. And 
another the last element of the rising action that I think is going to be part of the story is that there's going to be the demon slash billionaire slash goblins also have a physical conflict with the siren. There are players. They are moving throughout the stage. They're bouncing off each other, creating conflicts, creating drama, making the story interesting. Just catching up on chat here. Yeah. Interesting. So, following action. I once saw Peter David at a convention in Toronto. Peter David is a comic book writer. Uh, for the most part, he's written some novels and, and a few other things, but he's mostly a comic book writer. Um, he had a stroke a few years back, but he started writing again, and that's super awesome. Um, because the, the talk that I saw of him has kind of stayed with me uh, for many years now. Um, and the one thing he said to me, or well, he said to the group, I guess, it wasn't just me, I wasn't the only person there. But the one thing he said was that Karate Kid, the first one, the original, starring, um, uh, God, that guy who was in everything at the time. Anyway, the original Karate Kid from the 80s uh, is one of the best examples of how a three-act structure should work. Because it's ridiculously clear. The inciting incident. So you have you have a loser character who meets an old man who and starts helping him out. And there are bullies, and the bullies say, We practice karate, fight us. And he says, Okay. And he trains. Rising action. He trains. Inciting incident. Fight us. Rising action. He trains. Climax. Final fight. He gets on. He gets on one leg and does the crane kick. Fight ends. Falling action. Resolution. He won. He defeated the bullies. He gained respect for his teacher. Movie ends. The end. That climax to ending is three minutes long in movie time. It's three minutes. That's a good fucking ending. So yeah. And endings are one of the hardest part of writing uh, simply because it's so easy to screw them up. It's so easy to miss uh, your character's inherent wants and needs. It's so easy to um, to force your own sort of writer presence on it to to teach something. Um, yeah, it's difficult. So the thing that I'm thinking of, I think there's going to be uh, an aftermath of the ritual, and the resolution, going back to the killer for hire, 
is that there's a change in the status quo. At least for the moment. Uh, and obviously this is super general. Uh, I haven't really listed a ton of specifics here. But I think this is a good, the, for me and the way that I'm approaching the story at the moment, I think this is indicative of the arc that I'm trying to go for. And the more that we work on this project, the more that it's going to become apparent uh, how this all fits together. Introduction. Uh, something about the world. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't have a specific scene in mind. Uh, A good way to introduce it would be meeting at the King's Stables. And that'll kind of give us details about the Killer for Hire and um, the Billionaire and the general forces at play. So the only other uh, the only other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about before I take my second break is that this right here this right here is the dramatic arc of the story not all of this has to show up in the actual text. And I know that people are gonna give me this look like, what do you mean? How can you not show all the parts? Isn't that the point? And the answer is, well, yes. But when you're dealing with things like short stories and other short forms, like short mediums, what you'll find is, is that you don't have enough time or space to really detail all of these things. You can't show every single little thing in between. They're not interesting. Um, they're not interesting. You're wasting space, uh, various other consideration. And, and so because of that, we're going to start we're going to start probably somewhere in here. Like the first scene of the story is probably going to be something like this. Something to do with this. The, the killer for hire and the siren meeting. But the other cool thing about storytelling is that most storytelling is non-linear. It doesn't happen event, 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 event. It's not interesting to tell a story that way. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on the story. You can tell a story that way. But we have this awesome tool called non-linear storytelling with flashbacks, flash forwards, telling things out of order, going back and revealing new details about things we previously saw. Also called a retcon or retroactive continuity. These are techniques that we can use in order to be more effective with how our story unfolds. You don't have to tell it front, front to back, beginning to end. You can start at the end and go back to the beginning. You can start at the end, go back to a little bit before the end, and then go back a little bit before that, and then a little bit before that, and end with the beginning. You know who did that? Uh, 
or a great example of doing that? Pulp Fiction. The first scene is the ending. And every other scene leads up to that ending. And it all ties together nicely. So yeah, um, because, you know, this inciting incident intrigues me. I would like to write this scene. I don't think I'm going to start with this scene, though. I don't think this scene is interesting to start with. It doesn't introduce our protagonist. It introduces our perspective character, for sure, and his goals and wants and needs and whatever. But it doesn't introduce our protagonist. So, yeah, there's that. Um, and the other thing uh, I will t say a little bit about is uh, remember when I started doing this, the started working on this. Uh, I don't know, it was like a half hour ago, I guess. Um, but remember, I was saying that I'm almost going to be doing like the Killer for Hires dramatic arc and then the Cyrus dramatic arc. So when we look at this. We see that in the introduction and inciting incident and rising action, we have the killer for hires arc, like very strongly. We have his inciting incident. We have his introduction to his role. We have his conflicts. But his conflicts become the conflicts of the siren. And therefore, we end with the siren's dramatic, or dramatic arc of a confrontation at the ritual, the aftermatch of the ritual, and the changes in the status quo. So there you go. I did what I said I was going to do. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so. Uh, anything else I wanted to mention in this? Uh, changes to the kingdom? Something to think about. Thinking about it a little bit. And delete this. make this a separate file, I think. All right, so it's 8.59. I'm gonna take another five minute break. And uh, then we're going to come back. Uh, and I realized that I totally forgot uh, one of the things I said I was going to do. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about names. Yay. Tentative names, working titles. And then uh, we're going to do the book club, any Q and A's and wrap things up. So I will see you all at 9.05. Cool? Cool. All right.
All right, and we're back. Boom. Things. Stuff and things. Ghosts and stuff and things. More ghosts and stuff and things. Wow. Um, so yeah. What is the tentative name for this project? What are we going to call it? Bueller, Bueller, anyone, a a anyone? <laughs> yeah, I totally opened a uh, word title generators. Ooh, RPG names. That's what we need. Bum, bum, bum. Hmm. I'm tempted to go something super, super silly and traditional and do something like Siren's Call. Or, um, I can, I can, I can put this in a file. Titles! Let's make this one real big. Even bigger. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, whoops. Yeah, but what makes an interesting title, Johnny? What makes the title stand out to you? Hmm? Challenge. Too big. There we go. I don't know. The magic feather. Feather, feather. Um, a cool adjective, eh? So you subscribe to the Marvel School of, of Titles. The Amazing Spider-Man. The Incredible Hulk. The Astonishing X-Men. The Uncanny X-Men. Me, personally, I like titles that, um... I like titles that mean something and by that I I mean, I mean. Uh, by that I'm talking about titles that indicate something about what the story about something that happens in the story or something about its theme or something uh, I'm actually uh, in terms of 
chapter title naming, which is a little different, but I actually like uh, stuff that's named after dialogue, uh, things people say. Um, I'm cool with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> right and it sounds boring because or let's take this from the bottom years the billionaire's decision and the reason it sounds boring is because it has nothing to do with the, the dramatic art it, it the billionaire's decision doesn't matter To the, to the story, to what we're trying to do, to the theme. I mean, equally boring, or maybe a little less boring, it would be more likely to be the killer for hire's decision, the mercenary's decision. Uh, again, boring, but not as boring, because it's relevant. Bag of Blood. I actually don't mind that, though it's more of a, a vampire title. The Siren's Last Task. Blood for the Blood God. Stop quoting Horace Heresy at me. <laughs> God damn it, Sam. <laughs> yeah, but the Demon Awakening is, is kind of lame. I'll write it down. I'll write it down. Actually, I'll write all of them down. I'll, I'll copy and paste them, guys. Oh. What the? Do, 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 do. Copying all the things out of the chat. It's not a bag, it's a wine skin. I'm not trying to block the creativity, I'm trying to focus it. Trying to focus your creativity. Because I'm of the opinion that the title should have nothing to do with the demon and should have everything to do with the siren and possibly have something to do with the siren and the mercenary's relationship. And fair enough. I mean, this is only going to be a working title. It's okay that we don't know enough about the story right now. I just want something to call it other than the short story. Um, that being said, I'm actually using this a little bit as an exercise to help focus what we're doing. Names are very important. Uh, they have been for, for years upon years. And to the point where when we talk a lot about uh, oral storytelling and, and ancient legends and stuff, there's a lot of like 
knowing your true name and the power of names in magic. And and interesting enough, that's a I'm gonna write it down here just because nothing else. But knowing your true name is is an important part of demonology, and and kind of the way that we've talked about demons for for in stories for many years. Um, so there, th like that's that's a concept that relates to to what we're talking about. Um, I actually kind of like Fear of the Siren, but. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm tempted to do something like old school B movie style and and go and do something like kill the call of the siren. Because there's an aspect that I realized I've been thinking about subconsciously but hadn't quite grasped yet, but I just got it. And the reason I immediately went to it, to the Siren's Call, is because that's an important part of the way that their mythological stories are. The siren is supposed to be a temptress. Temptress. She's supposed to be a seductress. She's supposed to seduce you to her way of thinking. So. That's an important aspect. To what we're trying to do. It's an important aspect because always with the because um, the killer for hire in a lot of senses in, in, in a lot in some sense is being seduced. He's being pulled away from his original goal. The siren's call is is affecting him, right? So that has implications on on both how the story is going to play out and and whether or not he really makes his own decisions. Or, or is it a, a magical influence? And, and I'll tell you straight up that that scene, that scene with the physical confrontation between them, that the scene that I was playing on starting with, is going to play this right away. It's gonna be the first thing we encounter is is this weird seduction of the siren. And maybe the call of the siren needs to have a bigger a bigger part to play in the demon ritual. So, things to think about. Things to think about. But yeah. I'm okay with, with it 
implying a horror story aspect, I think we're dealing with monstrous creatures. So that implication is okay. We like I mean we haven't said anything about who the killer for hire is. Is the killer for hire even human? There's nothing that says he has to be. Is the billionaire human? Likely. I think so. But he doesn't have to be. So having a horror style, style like a horror stylization, I'm okay with that. I like the implications of that because we're we're playing in, in a lot of ways with one of my favorite like sort of exploratory themes is what it means to be a monster. That's a good theme. I like that theme. So there you go. From exploring a title, we've come, we've, or me personally, I've, we've discovered a little bit about how a specific opening scene is going to look. Uh, a big theme that we're going to use. Uh, ask questions about who our characters are and why they're doing what they're doing. So, there you go. And I think the winner that I'm going to pick is actually a slight difference. I think I'm going to pick Fear the Siren. Because it has such lovely implications about who the villain is. So, there you go. It's currently 9.23. And I am totally talking to you. You specifically. You who asked me questions. But the walls have ears, you know? That's cool. I like that. I like that. It's not bad. I'm going to add that to the list. Oh. But yeah. Just adding some metadata. Done. Cool. So there we go. And by by no means is this the final title. This can change. Uh, but I like it. I like it at the moment. I think it. I think it gives us a a, a direction to aim it. it gives us a, a feeling of tone. It gives us a feeling of theme. Uh, some of the plot elements and conflicts. I like it. I like it. Bam. All right. So, last thing we're going to talk about today. Uh, book club. Ba -ba -da -ba.
funeral. This is this week's book, writing fantasy and science fiction. Uh, it includes the old. Uh, yeah, I I realized that after Johnny, I, I got there. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, where is it? Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So this is the book, writing fantasy and science fiction. Uh, it originally started out as this book, How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy by Orson Scott Card. Um, so this entire book is in here. Then they added uh, some essays by Philip Athens and Jay Lake, and uh, some other stuff by the crew at Writer's Digest, uh, who are the publishers of, of both of these. Um, so yeah. Uh, I've actually read a significant portion of this, and that's in here, so that's awesome. Uh, the other thing is, is I have Orson Scott book, Orson Scott Card's book on characters, uh, which he also has elements of in here. Um, so I'm actually fairly familiar with a bunch of the content of this already, uh, which is awesome. Uh, it means I'm on the right track and I know things. Also, because I've been super lazy about actually reading physical books lately. Um, so I need to improve that. I should maybe see if I can get some ebooks uh, somewhere. Maybe the library. Anyway, I'll work on it. I'll, I'll be better. I'll be better. I will, I will read better. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by this book. Uh, there's a couple lessons in it that have stuck with me for a long time because I actually got this book when I was uh, 15, I think, 14, somewhere around there. I was in high school, like, or no, I was in middle school. Yeah, so 13 or 14 or 15, somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, uh, my favorite lesson uh, and is something that's really difficult, or not really difficult, but it's something that, that not everyone thinks of and it gets weird. But when you're writing characters in a, in a fictional setting, don't go out of your way to explain to the readers what things are. Present context for the reader. What I mean by that is that it's more effective for your character to... to reveal what something is by their own actions than it is to tell the reader what something is. Your characters don't think about things the way that the reader thinks about things. If there are flying cars in the universe that the character is in, they're not going to think about how weird a flying car is every single time they see one because they see one all the time. We don't, when we go for a drive, we don't sit down and explain to our passenger what a combustion engine is, how gas works. We might explain rules of the road to someone from a foreign country or something similar. Sure, totally legit. But we don't explain how a car works because pe everyone knows how a car works. The only way you, the only reason you would explain it to somebody is if they didn't know how it works, like a kid or uh, someone who's never seen a car before. I, I know that sounds crazy, but you know, there are some, some populated areas in the world that don't have modern technology. Not a ton of them, but there are some for sure. Um, and in, in, in having your character explain things that would be normal for them actually diverts the reader's attention away. It, it, it stops them from being pulled into the story by pointing out how, how weird things are. Um, it distances the reader from the story and they're like, it ruins their immersion. So that's one important lesson to learn from this book. Uh, the other, uh, another important lesson are types of stories. Um, I originally was going to talk about this a little bit more as part of the lesson, 
Uh, but I didn't feel like it really fit in anywhere, so I didn't. Uh, but there are four main types of stories. Uh, there's the mid-year story, the idea story, the character story, and the event story. Um, so a mid-year story is a setting story. The point of the story is to show off the setting. How it's different from our world. Commonly used for things like historical fiction. Or sorry, not historical fiction. Altered history fiction. Uh, what changed? What made the world different? How would it be different if certain things changed? In a lot of ways, Lord of the Rings is a mid-year story. We start in one place, a very small place, and, and we, we see parts of the world as it builds and, and how that interacts. There are other elements, of course, to Lord of the Rings and stuff uh, that do make it a little bit more of a character story. But in a lot of ways, it is, it is a, a mid-year story. Um, so an idea story. A story showcasing some sort of idea. Uh, some sort of point, lesson, uh, things like that. Uh, character story. Character stories are the most common type of story told nowadays. Uh, mostly because the film industry is super into character stories. Uh, character driven stories are like the thing that people want. Because it's easy for us to identify with characters. And characters and their wants and needs and identifying with them will drive a story home. Will make it impactful. Will sell tickets when people talk about it. You don't really get the same impact with a setting story. Though you can. Um, but it's different. And, and it's one of those things where these types are not mutually exclusive. By focusing on one... That doesn't mean you're cutting out the rest. It just means that one's going to be the focus and it's going to take most of your attention and, and present itself more often. Because um, you should never ignore characters. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't. So yeah. So that's a character story. Character driven about characters. Character arcs. All that good stuff. Stuff that we talked about today. I mean, three arc, the three act structure is is the the basic of basics of, of how a character story is constructed. Um, and then the event story, things happen, you react to them. Event stories are not very common anymore. Uh, they used to be fairly common in like the Middle Ages, and things like that. Uh, like if you read any like old King Arthur stuff. Uh, or uh, any of the, uh, what was that period called? Um, the sort of uh, romantic era of chivalry, or the age of chivalry, actually stories from the age of chivalry. Uh, they tend to be very event stories um, where things happen and characters react. Event stories are considered fairly weak in today's narrative standards because they um, the character never takes a proactive role in an event story and if they never take a, a proactive role it means things are just always happening to them and it, it doesn't really satisfy any of our any of the readers uh, needs like it doesn't it doesn't communicate ugh I'm not communicating. Uh, it doesn't... We, we don't identify with characters who only react to things. We identify to characters who have strong wants, strong needs. And having someone who just reacts to something is not impactful. It doesn't create good drama. Um, that's not to say they can't react to things some of the time, but I'm just saying like if that's all they're doing, it can get boring quick. Yeah, and it, it is certainly, it's more documentary than narrative, for sure. And like I said, like, it's more old-fashioned. It's not something that's very common. But if you're doing a stylistic thing, uh, it, it, it can certainly help. I mean, I think of stuff like that. Um, 
I, I think a lot in terms of uh, when I'm approaching fantasy, what are the myths and legends or the stories that people tell? Because we, we tell stories about King Arthur, we tell stories about, um, you know, like the Salem Witch Trials, and like there are, there are cultural stories that, that we talk about a lot. And whether or not they're historically true or not, whatever. But, you know, like Greek myths, um, uh, Norwegian myths, uh, those are, you know, big ones, right? Um, so in your fantasy society, like, they're going to have stories that were passed down that, that people still remember thousands of years later. I mean, they're probably not the same stories. They're probably different from being passed down and stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are, there are bases, right? So things like event stories and all that are great for, for inserting legends into other narratives, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, cool, good stuff. Lots of learning in this book. Um, I'm excited. Well, the second part is on, um, sort of. Uh, 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 a reasonably modern take on where the sci-fi and fantasy industry is at and how it got there, uh, which is super fascinating to me. Uh, and I do want to read a little bit more history books about genres and stuff. Uh, I do have a couple, and I hope that we'll cover them at some point uh, in the book club. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think that's it. If you have any questions for me, let me know. Uh, otherwise, you can contact me on my Twitter, at Freak Lab Mishaps, or uh, there are links. There we go. There are links to contact me on the web address below. Right there. Um, and also VODs, check out the VODs, uh, I should be posting the one for this episode tomorrow, uh, as well as show notes, uh, and, uh, other documentation, uh, that I realize I never really explained to people on stream, uh, but yeah, on the website there are show notes, so all of the notes that I've used to prepare the show and talk about on the show. Uh, I update those after the show ends so that they're complete and they have errata and, and I fact check myself and whatever else because I realize I make a lot of mistakes. As well as uh, all of the stuff we've worked on will all be posted in PDF on there as well. So if you want to check out uh, the, syn the synopsis and log lines and all that uh, or any of the other stuff we've done on the show, uh, those are all available. So yeah. I uh, think that's it for me tonight. Unless anyone's got any questions. Nope. Chat looks dead. Rah. Bang, bang. You feel lucky, punk? That's not even the real line. This is the one everyone says. Feel bad now. Bastardizing. Anyway. Uh, I'm sweating to death. So, yeah. You can call it a night. Turn off these lights. Go cool off. <laughs> uh, thanks for hanging with me. This was Accidental Origin. My name is Brendan. And this is the end of the weekly writing web show. So yeah, bye all.